In a previous episode, you gave me silver coins. Yes. And talk to me about how it has two different types of value. Uh, you just briefly recap that. Sure. It has value because it's made of metal, and the metal is valuable, in this case, silver, because you have to get it out of the ground. Silver has certain properties and is useful for things that other materials aren't. So it has a material, rarity, human effort value, and then it also has a collector value because of what the coin is, when it was struck, what's on it, how rare the coin is, how much collectors want it. So both of those things add up to value. So to be clear... I'm not into this. Yeah, I cur- can tell. currently, I'm I'm not into this. But <laughs> in the interest of learning about different things, I, I think it's interesting. Just a- as a thing, like the the idea that you can go buy, essentially, you're buying a metal, and you're waiting for time to do work for you, kinda. Or you're just storing sure. value. It's it's a way of storing value. It's like an original, the original way that people store value. Is that a way to say it? Yeah, it's money insurance. I mean, how do you take human energy and effort that you've expended or that someone else expended and then you traded for their energy and effort? How do you take that and bank it? How do you make it potential instead of kinetic? Because I, it's, it's like collecting solar. I, I don't just need electricity while the sun's out. I got to have a battery solution in case I need electricity when the sun's not out and I only have a solar system. Well, likewise... You don't know when you're going to need money, and money is representative of human energy and value. And so how do you store that? How do you bank it? One way to do it is with metals that everybody agrees are valuable and that everybody agrees are hard to get. And so, yeah, storage of wealth is one reason. Another reason is hedging your bets against the ebbs and flows of any given paper currency, something a little more stable than that. Another reason is fun. Because it's interesting. Yeah, it it's is a interesting, isn't it? Past. Yeah. Yeah. You've been telling me about going to a coin shop. Yeah. This is a thing you've been asking me to do for quite a while. I've waited until we were co located. Thank you. What do you think about taking a little podcast road trip? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so basically, dollars are worth what dollars are worth. We, we talked about this. Mm-hmm. There's an intrinsic value to a commodity like gold. This is a thing you've been doing, just buying small pieces of gold? Yeah, I'm trying to get a little bit of precious metals on hand. And my strategy is move a certain percentage of monthly income into things that aren't U.S. dollars, but they're still spendable because I'm not rich, so I still need to be able to buy things. Right. And so I give up a little bit of liquidity, money, a little bit of liquidity, and I have to pay a little bit to move USD into silver. But I just consider that small percentage above spot price to be what is spot price that's what the market value of at a given second okay and so i consider that little premium that i'm paying that little markup that anybody who deals in gold or silver is going to charge i just consider that an insurance premium like i paid 50 cents on that ounce to insure it against runaway usd inflation and the, the inflation we're admitting to right now is seven and a half percent year over year. Okay. I that I mean, whenever a government admits to inflation, it's a bad look for the government. So you always have to think in terms of that's the number they would admit to. The the inflation number you will get from a government about their own currency will always be the smallest number they could get away with saying. You think so? Yes. Why? Because it doesn't benefit. It does not benefit a government to acknowledge that their currency is fumbling, that their currency is weak or weakening. Just come on over, buddy. No, that's all good. <laughs> that's a really interesting maneuver. Yeah. <laughs> no signal light. No, no signal. Three just, lanes just, of traffic. Is <laughs> Which, yeah, put a pin in this. We should do an episode about driving sometime. Okay, we'll do it. Okay. But like, when you when you think about buying gold, in my head I got these bars of gold image in my head yeah i think that's for people with more money i don't 
How much? I'm not ready to go buy a bar of gold. A bar of gold's like <laughs> oh stupid God. money, right? I mean, it's right now as we speak, it's ticking up toward two thousand dollars an ounce. An ounce. So that bar of gold is a hundred ounces. So what? Yeah, it's two hundred k to buy a bar of gold. Right oh now. my goodness! You can buy a bar of gold. Yeah, you can buy a bar of gold. That's crazy. I, I am not but see, in what any way you... troubled to admit this. I own. A few, not a lot, but I own a few bars of silver, hundred ounce bars of silver, of silver, yeah. Which right now you could buy for twenty five hundred, twenty eight hundred bucks. Really? And I'll tell you why I have it. Why? The reason I got some of those bars, one, it, it's in my price range. I could justify it. I, I can't buy a bar of gold, but a bar of silver, I can afford that. And I'm in the process of acquiring everything I need to melt it into increments that are smaller. And so I want some ugly, rough poured hundred ounce bars in case I need increments that aren't readily available. Like I have one ounce, I have two ounce, I have quarter ounce, I have some junk silver, like quarters before 1963 and things like that, where you can calculate what's in there. Is this, okay, is that it? That's the store? Yeah. How are y'all doing? Oh, all right, here we go. Doing great, well. thank you. Uh, I am new to the whole silver and gold thing, and I was wanting to learn a little bit. It's going, it's going up and down like crazy? <laughs> yeah, up, up and down, up and down. Really? Way up today compared to months ago. So What's these, gold at today? Yeah, it didn't do much yeah. yesterday, but it's taken off again today. 19, gold was up 20 bucks and silver was up 50, 60 cents a year. Wow, okay. getting close to 2,000. Yeah, 1970, it's up $34. What Dow. happened? The Dow's down again today. The Dow's down? The Dow's down. Palladium is up 7.4% today. It's today? And five dollars today. Yeah, I just sold an ounce of it a little while ago for, uh, what was it, 3,000 and... <sighs> Sixty-four. Now it's eleven and four for the same. Did they look at your watch? Wow. <laughs> I've heard of that. Is that South Africa? Yes. Okay. How do you sell gold? Different rates for the different sizes. If I had any bullion, it would be uh, six and three quarters percent on American Eagle. Uh huh. Uh, five and a quarter percent on Maples and Krugerrands. And then they go up, the premiums go up as the size goes down. Mexico? 16? And gold's up 1.6%, silver 1.8, platinum 3.3, palladium 7.5. That's a lot of movement. Is that gold right there? Mm -hmm. That little thing right there is um, $700. This here? Yeah. No, I think that's silver. Oil's up 787 at 115, 7.3%. What is this? Off? Do you have one? That's what those are across the top. These are all sovereign? All across the top of that board there. So they're old? You know, they make some new sovereigns, but those are the older ones. Those are the ones that the U.S. government would put into the military's uh, emergency packs for dropping them behind lines. Really? Yeah. That's what they pack those packets with is gold for trading with the civilians. Huh. Because it would work when things it were would weird? Work nothing else would. You know, yeah. During World War II, that's what the U.S. government did. You had a little emergency pack about that big, and it would have 20 gold coins in it. Really? Well, that would go away. It would make, <laughs> oh yeah, they'd put Swiss francs, French francs, German marks, and uh, English sovereigns. Wow. So you had a mixture depending on what country you were going to go into. Can I see one of the sovereigns? Mm -hmm. So how do you calculate the value of this coin? Because you said... You take the price of gold, multiply it times that, and add that. Okay, so this is 0. .2354 ounces. Of pure gold. Of pure yeah, gold. Now, the coin's not pure, but that's the net weight of pure gold in the coin. Oh, I see. Yeah, so if you do it on the... The coin's 90% pure. Okay. Because they put 10% uh, copper in it for hardness. Otherwise, you, you, if you put a 24 karat gold coin in circulation, it'll be slick in a year. Really? Yes. So the copper's in there for hardness to make it last. So it's an alloy? Yes. Okay, and yeah. why the 12.5%? Is that because of this that's, particular coin? No, that's just the premium on that particular coin. That's your markup on that coin. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yep. The uh, little 10th ounce gold eagles are 25% over. A uh, quarter ounce is 18%. Half ounce is 11%. One ounce is six and three quarters percent. So is that and where you make your money? If I had to order them, I wouldn't make that much. Oh, you wouldn't? No. I see. No, 
they cost me market plus about 35 40 bucks really mm -hmm. okay and with that markup you're looking at about 65 dollar markup so you're doing the same math all day long mm -hmm. yeah interesting okay what is, so what is this one? This is a square one. That's a little five gram bar. It's 10% uh, over whatever its content is today. 10% over whatever its content is today. Mm -hmm. yep. What is the math on that? How much would that be? 31.1 grams in an ounce. So take an ounce, divide by 31.1, multiply times point, but times five, and then add 10%. Okay, let me get my calculator out. <laughs> so that's about 16, 15% of an ounce. You said, okay, so calculator. Yeah, it's about one sixth of an ounce. So, yeah, 16.6%. And then what is the price? 67.2. Looks like it's a $348 bar. That's a $348 bar. Wow. And that one's pure gold. Yes, those are pure. So that, that one, as you say, could not be used for circulation. Well, you can take it and bend it with your hands. Oh, really? Yeah, that's how soft gold is. Wow. So there's a company called Dotcombi that makes these where you can break off little one gram tabs. Yeah, you can buy so a hundred gram on. bar and it's a ten by ten, and you can bend them back and forth and pop them into one little one gram. So a hundred little one grammers. So really, it anticipates something to use for circulation. Yeah, use it for change. Wow, what's it called? The company? It's Valcambi is That's the... it there, above the signature Valcambi. Oh, hey, yeah, there it is. Oh, that's the same company that's right mm -hmm. on there. Yeah, that's one of the older ones that they had actually with a certificate. After that, they started sealing them in these little doohickeys here. That's not a snap bar because you can see the edges are yeah, round. finished. Mm -hmm. Those little snap bars, it's like a perforation, but it's. Yeah. yeah, I had some little one gram silvers, but one guy bought them all. It's clever though because you have to engineer that in such a way that you lose no gold yeah. with the snap, yeah. like right. any little shaving or anything, mm -hmm. you're burning cash. How do you measure the percentage of content in a in a coin? Like for example, you said that coin right there is ninety percent gold, ten percent mm -hmm. copper. Mm -hmm. How would you test that? Uh, we have a machine. It's like a hardness test. Lay it on the plate and plug it in. Touch it with the wand, and it tells you the purity. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about a four hundred fifty dollars for a scale like this. Oh, it's a, a authenticator. Other than that, the next ones up are in the twelve to fifteen hundred dollar range. Wow! For the ones with the multiple ones. So but for the most part, you can just identify a coin like these sovereigns, I and like as long as you know it, it's better. It's easier to tell a counterfeit coin than it is to tell a counterfeit bar. Really? Yes. That's why we do not buy anything larger than a five gram bar over the counter. How do you know? Hmm? The like, larger the giveaway one ounce bars. China is making counterfeits of all the larger bars. Yeah, that's and what, what they are is uh, it's a different metal on the inside and then a heavy, heavy, heavy gold plate. So a, a machine won't test it as fake. You have to cut the bar in half. That's why we won't buy them anymore. Really? Yeah. So they're flooding the market. I didn't want to buy the eighteen thousand dollar machine that it takes to tell them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not just like neighborhood people faking gold to get rich. That's somebody trying to mess with the gold market globally. Yeah. Yeah, there was one of the matter of fact, one of the major jewelry stores out of India needed a bank loan and so they went to the bank with all these gold bars and got this huge loan and the come bank come to find out all the bars were counterfeits wow they had a um, i think it's uh it's a metal t t uh, not titanium it's not another, tantalum no it's another metal they're putting inside the bars and then putting about two to three millimeter coating on the bar you know they're putting a one ounce of gold on a five ounce bar yeah so it's still got value but it ain't worth five ounces of gold yeah mm -hmm. uh do you have any ancients uh yeah, there was something packed for the show. We're heading for the A&A &A next week. Oh, cool. Yeah, we don't have any real high-quality ancients right now to take to the show. It's mostly junk, and it's not worth taking the junk. I've been gradually working on yeah, accumulating what it takes to demonstrate Roman debasement through the later oh, okay. empires, so yeah. I always ask when I go yeah, anywhere. Well, that's, that's an Athenian owl. We just got that yeah, earlier this week. That's pretty neat. You know, most that one's got a lot of test marks on it. That's what those cuts are. They're bankers' marks. Hmm. Bankers test cuts to make sure it was good silver. Hey, Destin. Yeah, it'll be a little. Check high, this It'll be out. a higher quality silver. This is descended of the uh, tetradrachma, hey. 
which is an Eastern Mediterranean okay. coin uh-huh. that became the one when uh-huh. Jesus said the drachma. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we pay it and uh, go go fish. fish. Yep. And Peter got that fish in Capernaum. The grandfather of that coin is what was in the fish's mouth. These are really neat, man. So Philip the Second of Macedon, that's Alexander the Great's dad. Some and of the old guys close personal friend of Aristotle. Yeah, they all find us like, it is entirely reasonable about the same that, yeah. uh, that Aristotle himself saw the place where these were being struck and went and toured it with his pal, Philip II. Like, Aristotle might have watched that coin being struck. Um, can I take a photo of a couple things in here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That would be awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, those are cool. Yeah. Thank you for all letting right. me poke well, around. I appreciate it. This episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Stamps.com, and I am excited to use Stamps.com because oftentimes when I need to go to the post office, it's after they close. And my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I can use Stamps.com to actually put the postage on the thing that, like with my own printer, right? Is that how it works? Yes, exactly that. You get this whole dashboard, and you can lay everything out and learn to do the whole shipping thing yourself so that then... All you got to do is drop it somewhere. The mail goes out and that's it. It super streamlines everything. It makes it the kind of deal where you don't have to wait in line. You do the whole thing on your account and you get discounts on shipping and the whole process. So it's cheaper too. Okay. So, okay, here's how I'm, I'm getting set up. So I went to stamps.com and then the top right, it says, did you hear about us on a podcast? Like it's got a little thing there. And I said, click, it says click here. So I clicked here and it says enter promo code. NDQ uh, for no dumb questions, and I click submit, and it says, "Welcome no dumb questions listener, special offer one hundred and ten dollar value offer details." I want to see what that says. Okay, your stamps.com offer get a free digital scale. That's cool, up to five pounds. That's awesome. Fifty five dollars of postage. That's cool. I like free money and free supplies kit. Let's see what's in the supplies kit. Take advantage of shipping labels, plain paper. That's awesome. So that's it. Stamps.com, top right corner. Say yes, heard from you on a podcast and type in NDQ and you can see everything right there. You can see what you get. Yeah, it looks like specifically the discount that you're going to get is up to 40% off USPS rates and up to 76% off UPS rates. So it's a legitimate savings. That's awesome. So this would be good for, like, if you're mailing a bunch of stuff out, like you've got a small business or you're doing, I don't know, you know, high school graduation cards. Did you do that? <laughs> Did you send out, like... Oh, yeah. I, yeah. If you if you got a bunch of stuff you got to mail out. I went out. to JCPenney. I stood in front of that that gray background, and I smiled with my shoulders turned sideways because the lady told me that's what you got to do. <laughs> and then I sent out those invitations, and I wrote all of them by hand, and it took forever. This would have been nice. <laughs> All right, so here's the offer. Go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, enter the code NDQ for a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts, and we are grateful that you would consider supporting the sponsors. Thank you very much. Okay, back on mics. There are two things that happened in that coin shop that I thought was very interesting. Number one... He said that you can't circulate a hundred percent gold coin because it would it's so soft it would what did he say? It'd be smooth in a yeah, year. Yeah, smooth out real quick. Right. So there had to be copper in it. And then he said, Well well, yeah, you, you have to put ten percent copper in it in order to make it strong. And he had a he had a device and it looked like a plate and a probe, and you would put the coin down on the plate and you'd have the probe, you'd touch the top. And that is how you test conductivity, which makes sense. He said if you were to coat, he said the Chinese are counterfeiting money, and if you were to coat some other material with pure gold, then it would still register as pure gold because the conductivity or the resistance would be the same. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. So an ounce of gold stretched out over a 10-ounce bar. So you're weaponizing the physical property, superpower of gold. Conductivity. And stretch out ability what was your term for that ductility ductility thank you yeah you're weaponizing the unique ductility of gold to be able to counterfeit gold bars in a way that you could only do with gold and then there was this other thing that happened where he goes to the back and he pulls out this book and he's showing you what he called 
What did he call he, uh, A horde. A horde. He said, this is from the horde I went, that I purchased. So he purchased these really old coins from people, and there were three coins in that book he showed you that were gold. Mm-hmm. You got very excited. So mm-hmm. can you just kind of ex- just recap for me? Because it got loud in the shop. I didn't really understand. You know, there was a tunnel. You know, just, Sure. Yeah. Yes, I get it. I get it. You're right in your assessment of what happened. There is a very useful conversation to say, here are the composition of these different gold pieces. Now, some of what he had were just 999, meaning as pure gold as pure gold can be. That's what you're getting out of those little bars. But they're not really meant for circulation. They're not printed by a government to be handed around. And so the You're talking about that five gram bar he showed me that was like 600 bucks. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. But the sovereigns that you looked at and then we pulled out of the case, that's a that's a gold coin. I think that would be roughly a half ounce. Uh, no, it was point. It's a quarter ounce. I don't remember what he had on it. That is the gold weight of the coin, not the weight weight of the coin. So it's the weight disregarding all of the stuff that makes it into an alloy, alloy that'll be a little bit tougher. So, so the question on that, he said... It's this much gold, but if you put it on a scale, it weighs more. How do I know that a, a coin is 90% gold and 10% copper? Because I, my dad told me a story when I was a kid about Archimedes, the Eureka moment. You've heard of the Eureka moment. Displacement? Yeah. So if I have a, a certain weight of gold and I put it in water, it will displace a certain amount of water meaning that's how much volume, and so you you can calculate density. And so the story I've always heard forever is that the king had a crown made of gold, and he wanted to know if the crown maker was giving him a real crown of gold or if he was faking it. And he issued a challenge to whoever, you know, this is apocryphal, I may be screwing this up. That's how all these stories work, sorry. Although you can actually read Archimedes' stuff. I wonder if this story's in there, I don't know. Archimedes gets in the bathtub, the water spills over the edges of the bath, and he's like, Eureka! Because he understands the concept of displacement. He goes back and he tests the gold crown and says, oh, it does or does not, I don't remember the answer, displace more or less. So so you get the density. Now, the Chinese counterfeit thing that this guy told us about would get around that. Because if you had a denser metal in the center of the counterfeit gold coin and you wrapped it in 100% gold, as long as you do the math, you could get a gold counterfeit coin that is the same density as pure gold. Hmm. I, I can do that math. I know how to do that. I don't know how to counterfeit coins, but I I could easily do... Outmaneuver displacement as a test. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I could figure that out. So anyway, my question is, I, I know that they put knurls on the outside of coins, and that's like why a quarter has ridges on the outside, and that's so a person can't pull out a pocket knife and shave the edges off the gold and retain a little value, and then pass the, you know, pass the coin along to the next person I'm spending with. I've kind of tangentially learned a lot about coins, but there's so much I don't know here. There's so much I don't know here. Okay, I'm just trying to figure it out and learning some stuff and really having fun with it on a couple of different levels. And both of those levels got tickled in our visit to the coin shop. So on the one hand, just the question of value came up, which we discussed in our earlier conversation, whatever episode that was. And we briefly lingered there. You learned some things about how you know what coins are worth, uh, how you would examine a coin, say a coin, value a coin. And it's pretty simple. You, You use investigative techniques to consider the actual physical composition. And the other part is, if you know anything about the provenance of the coin, who had it when, who made it, where it came from. I'm sorry, what was that word? Uh, Provenance, that's chain of custody with an antique. Provenance. I think that's right, but now the way you're asking, it's making me worry that I'm screwed up. No, I I just don't know that word. Provenance. Yeah, I think that's that's the right term. If if I'm wrong, we'll just let myself be embarrassed on the internet again. No, whatever. I'm learning. And so... If you're pretty sure of the chain of custody, that could increase value. That's why collector's items sometimes have certificates of authenticity and things like that. Oh. Or very valuable items like the Hope Diamond. I think we know everybody who ever owned the Hope Diamond. That would be provenance if I'm getting that. Okay. And then place of origin. 
So with the the sovereigns, those gold coins you were looking at, well, we know exactly who made them, what they were made for. They're stamped with the year they were made. And though governments might mismanage currencies at times, even intentionally, still, if I mean, if they strike a coin and then they put the date on the coin and we know the British government made it, like unless somebody's a very complicated fraudster, we know the details, the specifications of that coin. That's a sovereign from whatever year, 1930 or whatever. And we know what went into that coin and what they did and how it worked. And part of the way coin collecting works. Wait, wait, wait. When you say what went into that coin, you mean literally the percentage of yeah. alloy. Okay. That's published you. and knowable. Okay. And even if we didn't have those records anymore, one could gather to themselves, I imagine, a hundred identical sovereigns from the same run in the same year and sacrifice a couple of them to determine whether there's consistency between empirically between all of those coins. And if you test enough of them to say, look, they're all the same. They're all made of this. They were all built this way. This is what you get. So if you've got a coin that was mass produced, then there's predictability there because it's like, oh, well, that's a sovereign. Oh, that's a, you know, that's an American gold buffalo from 2019. I know exactly what it is because I know exactly how those were made. So that's kind of the advantage of having a government do the work or a very reputable, independent um, <laughs> I can't think of it. Yeah. Uh, an independent mint. Yeah. Yeah. So that part was fun. But the other part that was fun is something you and I talked about when I showed you this coin right here. And I'm gonna tell people what you're looking at. Uh it says Judea Procru Procurators Pontius Pilate AD twenty six through 36 uh, struck under Tiberius Matthew 27 11 through 26 okay and it's in a plastic holder and it has a hologram on the on the holder that says NGC numismatic guarantee corporation the official grading service of the ANA and PNG and it's a very very official looking stamp and in or hologram and the hologram makes me feel like there's some credibility to what I'm holding. The hologram is on the inside of the plastic package. The plastic package seems to be heat sealed somehow. And um, it, it makes it look like, Hey, this has been graded and scored and it is what it says it is because nobody's going to make that hologram unless they mean it. Yeah. But, Am I reading this right? It says AD 26 through 36. Like, That's correct. Like Jesus' ministry, exactly AD 26 then. through 36. Yeah. That's the coin that got me into this. That one right there. What I is did, this called? Uh, a Pruta, I think. A Pruta. What's the name of that coin? Okay. A-E Pruta. No, 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 no. Is it? That's what it says. P-R-U-T-A-H. Okay. So effectively, a small denomination of coin. It looks like it's bronze. Is it bronze? What is it? I believe that one is bronze. Yes, okay. that was my assumption. It I haven't looked in a while. I think it's bronze. It doesn't have a head on it. It like like there's not a head of a human on it. It looks like a, uh, I don't know. It looks like a, a shepherd's hook almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that is a coin that was struck under Pontius Pilate. Wow, like the guy who's in the Nicene Creed, the two thousand years ago. Yeah. Wow. And, and that it's was in my a hand. coin that was in circulation. In exactly the place at exactly the time that Jesus and the disciples were out hiking around. Well, we know this wouldn't have been in Judas's bag, or he Judas would not have been paid this for betrayal because that was silver. Yes. How many thirty shekels of silver? I think that's the rumor. Yeah. So this is bronze. So this wasn't in that bag. No. But we know it could have been in a bag at some point along the way and bought some bread or something. Yep. That's whose crazy. pocket was that in? It's pretty fun. And so I, I talked to you about this when I did the Pontius Pilate project. You and I talked about the Pontius Pilate yeah. thing here. That's the coin. I ordered that because I wanted to be able to show it in the video. And it was interesting online when I got it. Like, oh, that's cool. But then when I got it in my grubby little hand, it's like, dang, I wonder if Jesus held this because he's a really big deal to me. And he may have used some coins here and there. Did he use this one? Did somebody who watched the crucifixion have this in there? Like, it, it's just crazy where your mind goes. And then you realize that's one of the really cool things about coins. What else in life 
do we have that we own for only a fleeting moment, and then we give to somebody else, and they give to somebody else, and they give to somebody else? It plays such a unique role just in terms of one physical item passing between all of us. Yeah, the bills don't last, but the coins do. Yeah. And that circulation pressure means that, I mean, did a a hundred thousand people have this coin? I'm sorry, what did you say? The circulation pressure? I think pressure is the term that's used to describe how quickly money goes between hands in any given economy. Okay. Uh, That might be the second or third term I've used in this conversation that now I'm feeling nervous about. Dude, we're we're in your turf, man. We're not. (laughs) I know that's risky. I'm not sure how good an idea is to be in, in my turf. But this thing got my attention and it just made me think about value and lasting value and also that value that is passed around between us is a point of connection between us. And so the other thing that that takes me to is that this coin tells a story. Pontius Pilate had terrible relations politically with a whole bunch of people back in Italy. So he's making money, he's making buildings, he's doing all kinds of economic gestures to be like, look, Tiberius, see, I'm really good at my job. I'm I'm not like... I'm not like the guy who appointed me, who you had executed, who was a fraud and a liar. Like, he might have appointed me, but I'm a very good governor. You can trust me. Hail hail Caesar. Like, I'm I'm a for you. And so even the fact that this coin exists could be construed as a compensatory gesture on the part of a flailing local governor to demonstrate to a very powerful, increasingly unhinged emperor that he's competent and can be trusted to continue to govern in Judea. All the coins tell a story. And one of the stories that I've discovered that I think is so interesting about this ancient coinage is the story of the Roman government gradually screwing its own people out of money to enrich itself, hoping that they would be none the wiser. I'm game. Okay, this is debasement. This is what yes. the word you told me, and I don't quite know what it means. Will you please explain debasement? With enthusiasm. Okay. Roman history breaks up neatly into two parts. Or, or two big parts. And it's okay if people don't remember this from school, it's easy. The first part is the Roman Republic. This is your Pompey, Julius Caesar, Marius, Sulla, the Gracchi, all of that crowd. The Punic Wars, Hannibal, Scipio Africanus, all of those names are Roman Republic names. So a Senate rules things and you don't have an emperor. Okay. Then, famously, on the Ides of March, 44 BC, the first citizen, effectively the dictator of the Roman Republic, which shouldn't be possible, gets executed, gets assassinated, rather, by Marcus Junius Brutus and his pals, Julius Caesar, gets stabbed to death again and again, and he dies, and it sends Rome into chaos. There's a big civil war, and the winner of that war is Julius Caesar's godson, Octavian, And Octavian establishes himself as the first emperor of Rome and takes the name Caesar Augustus. So now we have a Roman empire that starts a few years before the birth of Jesus. Tracking with that? Okay. So long story short, there was tribalism. Mm -hmm. One dude got powerful. Mm -hmm. The people revolted. Mm -hmm. He got killed. The people didn't so much revolt as much as the warring elite senators. Senators. They killed him. Yeah. They thought he was getting too powerful. They killed him. And so lather, rinse, repeat, evil, whatever. And then we end up with Augustus. Yes. Okay. A very powerful, but really in the grand scheme of things, very good emperor. Pretty smart dude. Okay. It was downhill from Augustus. <laughs> like, there... So Augustus was good. Morally good? Uh, morally as good as you could expect from a Roman emperor. Okay. Um, yeah, pretty just, pretty fair, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, still even maintained a Senate in name, like to try to demonstrate that he was working with the people. Uh, he was very politically savvy. He read the room very, very well. But what had been happening is about a hundred years before the end of the Republic. How big is Rome at this point with Augustus? With Augustus is big, 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 big. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, superpower. Yeah, uh, most of Europe, almost all of what we would now call Europe, North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, clear into Asia. Wow. Big. Okay. Yeah. And what had been happening was instead of coins being minted by the Senate and depicting nothing, these big men came along in the last hundred years before the 
the republic collapsed. And they started to find ways to mint coins with their faces on them. And this is a shift in what money means. It's shifting the value away from you can trust the gods and the Senate to provide democratically for each other to count on this big man. Look at that name and that face. And so the, the meaning, the message of money changed. But the basic unit of silver currency in Rome in those days was called a denarius. Denarius, I've heard of this. Yeah. It's made of silver, pure silver, as pure as silver could be back then. And it weighed a certain amount and is about the, the shape and size of a nickel, a little bit thicker. What's than, on it? A face? Uh, different things were on the denarius at different points in history. Uh, initially not a face, eventually some different faces. And what happened was, because Rome was was making its wealth through uh, mining the land and cultivating the land, but also through expansion and warfare, the most important economic issue is how do you pay the troops? You How do you pay the legions? Well, a day's wage was a denarius. You just simply drop that coin of that weight into the hand of each one of your soldiers for every day they soldiered. Just that simple. It's beautiful, right? Yeah, simple. It's not salt. I, I've... I've heard a lot of people say salary comes from the Latin word, I don't know, salt, something like that. But uh, the book the book Salt that I read said that there's not a lot of uh, truth to that. Yes, that's one of those historical rumors I've heard a lot too, but I know this is historical reality. Okay. So maybe that happened much, Somewhere, much earlier, yeah. but um, the idea of paying a day's wage dates all the way back to the Punic Wars between Rome and North Africa, Carthage. There's an opportunity here, though, as Rome goes from being a republic to being an empire, to get a whole bunch of money anytime you want to call in this move. Now, socially, economically... What move? Well... You're about to explain it? Yeah. Okay. But you know what it is to have a move banked, like a thing you could do once to wring some more money out of a business, a deal. Like, I've got a friend, for example, who doesn't charge sales tax at his restaurant. Okay. It's just whatever the number is, that's exactly what you're going to pay. The tax is built in. Okay. Well, I suppose anyone who does business like that, at some point, if you know things got rough or whatever, you could just charge tax like everybody else. Or, and you're basically just adjusting the costs you know, to reflect the tax that you're already having to pay. And pretty much nobody would be mad because you pay taxes when you buy something at a store or a restaurant. Yeah, so that's a move you get to do once. Once. Yeah. But then if you're like, oh, I'm going to do double tax now, everybody's like, what, what the heck is that? No, that doesn't just, work. You're raising your prices, yeah. There was a move that it seemed like you could do once, and that move would be to do a currency collection. You have all these days wage denarii hanging around out there in this Silver. gigantic empire. Silver. Okay. Just crazy amounts of very valuable silver. Well, one of the early emperors, Tiberius, the guy who was emperor at the time that Jesus was alive and crucified, he does a money collection. He does a big call in. And I think some of the other early emperors did as well, where he's went and bought back or took back through the power of the empire tons. And I've heard different estimates, but like insane amounts of denarii. And he had some big public works projects that he and his successors wanted to do. So they brought all these back in, and they just took the purity from 98% pure to 93% pure. So they just melted down all these old coins. They're, they're dirty. We're just going to clean them up and do a reissue of this coinage. Don't worry, you'll still get paid a denarius every single day. And this is the physical value yes. of the coin. So, like, for example, when we were at the coin shop, mm -hmm. I saw some quarters from 1964, mm -hmm. and they were silver. They were silver quarters. Not a hundred percent, but oh, I, yes, they're not a hundred percent. I remember as a kid, we would get all of our our coins that mom and dad put, you know, in the drawer, and we got to like roll those. And one of the things that mom and dad instructed us to do was go through, see if you see any that are pre nineteen sixty four. Is that yes. the year? I, I, pre sixty four, I okay. think is right. Okay, and so so this is actual value. This is actual silver value. And right. so he's taking the one hundred, no, the ninety eight percent silver. Mm -hmm. he's bringing it in, and you said go to 93%? Yeah, so all you do is you just melt down all the old coinage from 100 years earlier. You tell everyone you're doing them a service. You reissue prettier coins that have a prettier image on it. The edges are maybe a little cleaner. People get it. It's like getting a crisp but, bill. But you could, if you did that, you mm -hmm. could use the exact amount of silver 
and make more coins because the volume of the silver yes. and it okay so i'm with you now that's or the, just I'll, don't make the coins at all and just pocket a whole bunch of giant 100 ounce ingots of silver okay in your imperial treasury and don't tell anybody you did it what did they do that <laughs> oh they kept the silver no, they kept the silver or they just kept a certain amount of coins to themselves I mean, it wasn't like people had access to the books i mean the way we know that this happened more than anything is you can empirically verify it today you can't hide that move from history mass spectrometry or whatever whatever the, the <laughs> instrument whatever is whatever call it yeah and once you do that you send a, an echo a ripple forward into history that will never stop until the last of those coins is gone so you do this move, everybody knows you did this move and that you scoundreled forever. It's not a matter of historical debate. This is historical, inarguable, the same way you deal in facts in your line of work with physics and numbers. So this is one of those places where I can say, no, 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 this isn't historical opinion. This happened and we can empirically demonstrate it with as much consistency as you can demonstrate stuff when you test a rocket. Did they have dates on the coins? Yeah, dates or images, so we okay. know when they were struck and oh, who see. is who. I see. They, you know, uh, Claudius isn't going to strike a coin that portrays Augustus or you know an emperor who took over from an emperor he had assassinated isn't going to strike a coin of that guy. Right. They're going to make something that makes them look good and glorious. And so Tiberius and his successors flirt with this. And it's really, it's just a, a small clerical cost. You'll get new markets and new buildings and magnificent sculptures. We're going to build a Colosseum someday. If anybody complained, I mean, the public works yeah, of Rome. Yeah, I, I kind of want a Colosseum. A, yes. I kind of want a Colosseum. Wouldn't. So you just take my coin and you just like, just change it, make it newer. Right. And then I get a Colosseum? Yes. Heck yeah, let's do it. It's a newer, shinier coin. Yeah. Well, but let's say one guy did that. And then the next guy comes along. Things are a little tight. He'd like to make something awesome and like to be way richer, too. But, uh, well, the guy before me already did the debasement trick. I can't really. Literally the next guy? Well, it got to be that. Yeah. Really? So Nero, who was a maniacal crazy, who ran things in the 60s AD, he did a pretty significant debasement. We're at 93%. Mm-hmm. Okay. And... He pulled some fast ones with how the coins, what they weighed and what they were valued at in a way that would rearrange how the daily wages were paid. And so now we're starting to see that you know when, when Roman soldiers take their denarius out to the edges of the, the empire and they go to buy things, eh, savvy traders out at the edges are like, yeah, that says Rome on it, but this isn't like what your coinage used to be. Uh, I'll give you one bushel. Not to. Really? You're like, wait a dang minute. Because it's actual silver value. And people figured out. It took a minute to so, figure it out. So but it they figured smaller? out your coins are a lie. Right. It either weighed less or the actual silver content was less and it weighed the same. Okay. So they're just skimming. I mean, it's just it's just government-sponsored coin shaving. They're, they're taking the edges off. It's the same thing that the citizens wanted to do. Except the citizens go to prison for that. And the government gets to do it again and again and again until... Well, eventually the thing gets run down to nothing under one of the good emperors, Marcus Aurelius, I believe it was in the second century, we go down to 75%. Whoa. Huge leap. Yeah. By the time we well, get- Are you saying we went from 93 to 75? 98, 93, and Nero took it down further and then down to 75. Wow. Then we get into the early third century and a, a really unimpressive, uninspired emperor named Caracalla who most people only know about because he built a big elaborate public works bathhouse near Circus Maximus. I've never even heard that name. What would you say? Caracalla? Yeah, Car uh, Caracalla, Caracalla, C-A-R-A-C-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, I think. Okay. Um, he funded this project by debasing even further and pulling some sleight of hand to create a dua drachma coin that was like two denarii. So it was presented, the face value was two denarii. That's a denarius, but two of them. Two of them. So it's a bigger silver coin. You're you're saying this as if I'm supposed to know drachmas and denarius. Like I know dollars and cents. Yeah, I realize I threw that one out. Don't worry about what drachmas are. That's a just a rabbit trail we don't need to chase down. Let me say it differently. I know that you can catch them if you go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Anyway, that was really, really good. Keep going. So it's a two denarius face value coin. 
That's not actual mineral value. The government says this new silver coin that we made under Caracalla, you're going to love it. It's one coin, but it has the value of two denarius because we said so and we did paperwork. And everybody's like, okay, great. And then they start circulating it and they realize that only has one and a half denarius value of silver though. Like you cut out 25% of the silver and tried to sell it back to us saying it was worth a full two, but it's only worth one and a half. So in alloy or in size? In total weight. Okay. Total silver mineral weight. They cut 25% off of it in an attempted sleight of hand. Well, it worked to build a bathhouse nobody cares about and you can go look at the ruins of. But now what starts to happen is that the, the main work sector of Rome, that being the military, the soldiers, the people who get paid are like, yeah, we're not going to work for you anymore. You're paying us less. You say it's the same thing, but when we go to spend it, it's not worth the same thing. It doesn't, doesn't buy it. I can't afford the rent anymore. I can't afford bread anymore. Like my, to use our modern language, my dollar just doesn't go as far. And it's really nice that you're paying me 12 bucks an hour or 18 bucks an hour. But if bread's three bucks a loaf all of a sudden and gas is eight bucks a gallon and the rent skyrockets to three grand a month, like that might've been generous five years ago, but money doesn't go as far anymore. Now, most people don't understand in the Roman empire why the money isn't going as far anymore. They just look at it and they say, Oh, nuts. Stuff just keeps getting more expensive. But if human energy and work are the true market, stuff didn't get more expensive. Your money just got worse. Hmm. Because that it, your silver would still go as far if you had the same amount of silver. They just were getting less silver and trying to spend it like it was the old amount of silver. Right. So it broke. <laughs> This episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Raycon. They make super high quality, also very affordable earbuds that we both use all the time. I now have four pair of these because they are affordable and I stash them in different places that I know I might need them or that someone might need them and then I carry one around in my pocket. I have also been giving Raycons as gifts and one of the things that I super like about them is that when I put them in, they just stay in. They've got this little customizable set of, of jellies, the little the things that you can snap on ear there and hole adapters. try different ear fits. Yeah. Ear hole adapters. Yeah. Yeah. And they stick. They're just money. I mean, one of the weaknesses of the cheap, lousy earbuds that I've tried that other people have is they don't stay in your ear. And if they don't stay in your ear, they're super ineffective. But these stick, and I like it. Yeah. Raycons are great. I love them. I use them all the time. One of the things I use them for is if I'm taking the kids to practice or something like that, I'll have my Raycons with me and I can listen to an audiobook or something while I'm walking around the field and stuff like that. I also use them to mow. So uh, I use these things all the time. If you want to check them out, and I think you should try it, go to buyraycon.com slash NDQ to get 15% off your order. And I'm going to spell that URL out. It's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, as in November, by Raycon.com slash NDQ. 15% off your order. I've got several different styles uh, and colors. I think you will enjoy them, and I think you're right about the affordability of them. Uh, I see a lot of people talking about, uh, well, these earbuds are these earbuds. The thing about it, when you lose these, because you might lose them, actually, I have all of mine, but like if you do, it doesn't ruin your week. It's like, oh, I'll just get some more because I like them. And uh, I've even run them through the wash machine before, and they came out the other side just fine. I love them. Buy Raycon.com slash NDQ and get 15% off your order. Yeah, I'm finding the Raycons work really well as a gift, just a go-to. I have a mental list in my mind. Have I given this person a pair of these yet? And if not, boom, I got their next gift figured out for birthday or Christmas or whatever, and nobody's been disappointed you get a ton of battery life too, eight hours of playtime on a charge and then 32 hours out of the, the little pack, the, the little pill that you plug them into. So we both think they're fantastic. Again, it's buyraycon.com slash NDQ to get 15% off your order. That Raycon's been awesome. Like they've been with us for a long time. So huge thanks to them for making this podcast happen. And huge thanks to all of you for supporting the sponsors. So debasement, to summarize. So debasement is when I take the actual mineral content is it a mineral a, a metal content? metal metal yeah. the actual elemental content of the coin mm -hmm. and i dilute it mm -hmm. 
with some other thing. What is? What do they dilute it with? Like copper, tin. Yeah, <clears throat> copper. Eventually, bronze. Okay, real cheap stuff. Really. So they dilute it and then they pass it off as if it's the same value, but it's not the same value. Okay. And and the implications of that, at first, you might be able to do it and it might work. Mm -hmm. But as it gets less and less valuable, then people catch on until eventually you only have the fiat value yes. of the of the currency which is there you go we all agree that this has value because we agree that it has value and because the government promises they'll back it up you go spend this this way everybody and somehow magically we will make sure it does what it's supposed to do but that doesn't work because truth is whatever someone's willing to pay on a given day Truth isn't made by by force in the market from the top down. Everybody's tried it at some point. Every every flailing oh. government tries it, but you just can't make a thing worth something by decree. It's worth something by merit. And well, that might not feel good, but it's truth. I'm I'm starting to understand cryptocurrency's value in a different way now that you said this because okay, so fiat currency the the worth is determined by the people that set the the value which in a government's sense whether it be Rome or Portugal or America or London or you know England or wh whoever it is that value is set by a centralized power and if i have the ability to collect the coins figuratively whether it be on paper or what and reissue the coins or you know, in the case of a true fiat currency where I, there, the physical value isn't tied up in the coin, mm -hmm. I can just issue more coins. There you go. And then that's how you get inflation. And so that's that's an an opportunity for a government to do that. However, if we have a cryptocurrency, see, I went all in on cryptocurrency once I understood it was decentralized. Yeah. And I understood there will only be 21 million Bitcoin created. Yeah. And I, I didn't go all in. But but once I – that's the moment I was like, oh, this is actually based on a limited supply. Yeah. And once I understood that, I understood this can't be debased. I, I didn't know that word at the time, but a, am I thinking correctly? Yes, you are. Okay. I thought it was like magic money at that point in time, magic digital money. But what I'm realizing now is it's it doesn't actually have anything backing it other than math. So we still depend on the, hey, I trust and you trust that this has value, merit of it's it. This is also the case with silver and gold. Yeah. So we, oh, wow, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, oh dang, man, this is crazy. Yeah, people used shells for currency at a time. They just all agreed. Okay. Man. But it's really easy. It's really easy to flood the market with more shells. Ultimately, the real money is food because that's what gives you life force. <laughs> uh, that's a good measure. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's where you get into commodities. Yeah. And that's why commodities are a, a separate category that I don't understand and can't speak to. <laughs> Other than like these are hard things that make fuel and eating and existence go. Well, to round out the, the Rome story, though, it got debased all the way down to 0.05% silver. What? Yeah. So they would take coins like this one I'm going to put in your hand right now. And. That is a fourth century coin. Oh, wow. And that one right there was, I don't know what you call it, a silver dip, a silver wash, I think maybe people call it. And what would happen there is just unapologetically, this is only going to look like silver for like a couple of weeks. We're going to dip it in some silver and look, it's a silver coin. Look how shiny it is. Don't look any closer. That'll work. That'll buy it. The government says that's worth something. Well, of course, gradually that silver flecks off and you can see just a little bit of that silver wash still present on that debased Roman coin. If I handing. use my imagination, I might be able to see. It, it looks brown. It looks like a sad penny. There's one little fleck, and it's a little hard to pick out, but that was a silver washed coin. Okay. So that is getting down toward that final debased, valueless currency. What is the name of this coin? I do not know the name of that coin. Okay. But what I do know is that runaway inflation, inflation kicks in like pretty soon. Well, now the military comes back, and if you've got a country built the way Rome's built and you don't have a military, it doesn't work. So they're coming back, and they're like, uh, yeah, De Denarius isn't even close to getting it done. You've got you've to pay us way, way, way more every single day because 
we're not going to go kill people for you and protect your borders if the money you pay us won't even buy us one meal to get through the day. That's not a fair deal, and we won't do it. Doesn't matter how much people like Rome. Doesn't matter how much like they like their comrades and their buddies. They're not going to do it for nothing. And the economics quit making sense. And so then what do you do if you burned through all of your mineral resources, you burned through all of your treasury, and all you have left is your word that things are worth something and you're the Roman government? I don't know. You're done for. You reach the death spiral point. And that's what happened to Rome. Now, Rome... Are you telling me Rome fell because they devalued the currency? Yes. Right. Yes, I believe that is why Rome collapsed. Is this an accepted theory or is this... It's your... an accepted theory. Okay. Yeah, there are competing theories. Famously, Edward Gibbon argued Christianity made it soft in the 19th century in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Seminal work. Okay. Could be. Other people argued that they were too dependent on foreign grain. I would argue that if inflation hadn't happened, they would have been able to continue to afford that. Other people argued that when... The Visigoths and Ostrogoths invaded Rome and sacked it. They made peace by just bringing them in and letting them rule. And that that broke things because you no longer had any kind of national identity or unifying values. I think the simplest explanation is, it, look, if everybody's bellies are full, Augustus understood this one, bread and games. He knew bread and games make it work. If everybody's belly's full, if everybody feels a degree of security, if everybody's vested in something and they're building a thing and it seems like it's getting better, they don't care. Nobody riots. Nobody cares. Your society works. It doesn't matter if somebody's from somewhere else or looks different or give has everybody a, a phone haircut. and and make them think that they're an internet celebrity. <laughs> and uh, it'll work for a minute. Yeah. And so I think that Rome would have overcome all of those other problems that people attribute its fall to, if inflation hadn't been running away. Could have could have coped with all the other stuff if the money worked, but the money quit working. It's hard to properly quantify how absolutely upside down and broken economically this thing was. And there was nothing you could do. I mean, what are you going to do if you're Rome? Like, no, we promise this time it's worth something. I mean, come on, Charlie Brown's going to quit kicking that football someday. That's what you run into here. But to put a bow on something you said that's important, what's a little different about American money and printing dollars is that it's not attached to any kind of silver or gold. So it's not really debasement like the the bill you hold now has less mineral value or the quarter you hold now has less money value than it did, say, five years ago. We didn't physically print most of the money that we just authorized in the last couple of years. We just bank arranged it. So there's no mineral transference between the government and the people. So it's not really debasement in that physical resources are being stripped out of the money and then we're giving the money back to people. It's just flooding the currency market with so much more money that where there was $100 in circulation and you and me and our other 98 friends all have $1, that dollar goes a long ways. You throw another $500 into that, all of a sudden our $1 has a lot less purchasing power in that same circle of 100 people. You have degrees about ancient history or whatever, or you took classes on it or whatever you did. <laughs> what did you do? Whatever. You've got the chops. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so... I'm not going to argue any points you're making. What I will say is, in my mind, I don't fully accept that Rome fell solely because of deep basing currency, because I think that it could be very, very complicated. There could be many, many other factors. I'm happy to concede that possibility. Okay. So, but but it certainly seems like a contributing factor based on the story. Like anytime you take the the strength of an empire and you debase it, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's very, very interesting. You're effectively emptying the the uh the what would it be called like the the storehouse the uh, treasure the treasury yeah the treasury thank you so that's fascinating that's where i'm thinking in the past now i'm thinking in the far future a digital currency is going to happen mm -hmm. it's going to happen it's probably going to be a centralized digital currency oh. i i think it's going it's going to be yeah i mean yeah. Uh, Facebook tried it. Everybody kind of laughed at it because nobody trusts Facebook. But, you know, I think China's going to try it. They pay with QR codes right now at the train station. It's fascinating. Uh, if their behavior is good enough, they pay with well, QR codes. Yeah, you're right. 
someone told me that they were in China recently, and they said it was fascinating because beggars on the streets would have phones with QR codes. That's what they said. I haven't been there. They said they recently got back, and they're very excited to go back and just see it. They said they don't... They were telling me that there were beggars on the streets that would hold up a screen to you or a piece of paper or something with a QR code on it, and that's how they were begging. I've seen Venmo begging, though, now that you mention it. I've seen a guy with a sign with his... QR code? His Venmo ID. Oh, really? Send it here. Really? Yeah. That's fascinating to me. So I, I think a digital currency will happen. And unlike Bitcoin, which has a set volume of coins that will happen. Mm-hmm. The the thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is that more is being made at all times. And the reason that's interesting is because as your population grows, if I have $100 and 100 people, everybody gets a dollar and we start trading around and you know, the people that make the right moves get more money and the people that, you know, just don't get a break for whatever reason have less. If there's a cap of $100. Correct. But yeah. But as these people start procreating and more people exist, then that hundred dollars amongst 150 people, that means the value of money goes up. The the money is more based, so to speak. So you have to build in a way into such a system yes. to create more currency. Yes. Ideally, you would make the currency at the same rate of the people. I I'm a, I'm sure that inflation is healthy to some extent. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> sure, I think uh, yes, it can be healthy to some extent. And to your point there, you're not just making more money, you're making money that is catered to efficiently change hands to encourage trade and community. So if you you only have $100 and you're like, and it's all going to be in ones, good luck, trade everything in increments of one. Right. Well, now your currency doesn't make any sense. It's not doing its job. You got to find ways to break that up. This is fascinating. So, So... What I'm thinking about in the far future is for whatever this, the digital currency that is or becomes the thing, at some point they're going to have to issue that for the first time. I'm assuming you're going to trade in your dollars for it. And also, I, it's so weird. I, I bet there's going to be a, a period of time where the basis for the digital currency is the dollar. Sure. Yeah. I mean, have you followed the tether deba- you debacle? You can't just snap your fingers and make that move. Probably. Do you know what tether is? I'm not sure. I do. So tether is a cryptocurrency, USDT, and I know that one. So it, it's an attempt to tether the US dollar to a crypt to crypto. Oh. And so, if you think crypto is about to bomb, you can go to an exchange, or at least you could for a long time, and you can do an exchange between Bitcoin or Litecoin or Dogecoin or whatever and USDT. It's a quick way to park money as actual dollars. But what was happening is, so if that was true, there would be one USDT for every US dollar, right? Okay, yeah. Except there's USDT, there, except there's Tether and there's dollars. So they were making money out of nothing. Right. And they just did it first, and so everybody liked it. And then there was this really weird debacle, and there's a huge lawsuit right now that I don't understand, but I'll send you an article that Grant Sanderson sent me. It's really, really interesting. So we're in this strange in-between time. So just like Rome, we were in this strange in-between time between 98% silver and we just trust this money because it's money and we agree Uh. to trust it. So we were in that strange in-between time. We as humans are entering into a new frontier financially, where we're transitioning from, hey, this is a dollar, to, hey, this is a, insert name of digital currency here. We're making that shift, and that shift hasn't happened for a long time. I, I, am I making any sense? You're making a ton of sense. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's kind of freaky. It's interesting. It's very concerning to me that this might be centralized. I would love to just see the USD, the euro, I'd love to see these currencies that have worked okay just heal up, like things to balance out. I don't have a lot of great strategies for how to achieve it. If I were king, I don't know what I would do. Did you say heal up? Just heal up. What does that mean? Get back into some sort of scale that's reflective of reality. Right now, we're way too slanted toward inflation. And so, I mean, look at the housing market. People can't buy houses. 
I look at the food market. You, you can't eat out. Like we raised the minimum wage a whole bunch to try to compensate for this and make it work, which is empathetic and a really noble idea. But the downside is you got to really keep doing that. I mean, that's a, raising the minimum wage is raising the denarius. That's raising the equivalent of the daily wage that Rome had. Yes. You tinker with that. That's tricky. But at the same time, I totally get where somebody's coming from when they're like, I make 12 bucks an hour. I need to make 18 or I just can't even function. And I live modestly. Dude, I, um, my young friends, when I got out of school, I made $40,000. Wow. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Two, 2000. Props to you. 2006. I was a GS5. That's true. You got out of school in 2006. Okay. I, I was a GS5 step seven, which is a, you can look it up on the internet and figure out how much money I made. And, and I was not unlike that Roman soldier. I'll you just bear with me. I was not unlike the Roman soldier in that my salary was determined by a pay schedule that the government said, this is what your pay sure. schedule was. Yeah. Gradually over time, I, I was like, well, it took me many, many years before we bought a house. And when we bought a house, we bought a modest home and we, you know, we spent a lot of time saving up a down payment. We tried to get to the 20% level so we could avoid PMI, um, mortgage insurance. And so, but it was doable if you were smart with your money. Right now, coming out as a young person, the, the idea of trying to purchase a home as a young person straight out of school right now is so intimidating. Yes. I don't think that's great. No, no, it's not great. It's terrible. Yeah. Because what you're saying, what's happening as inflation occurs, is well-intentioned people, even people in government, are like, oh, we just need more money. Like the problem is people don't have enough money. How do you get people more money? Make more money. And so then do we infuse with cash? We did it in 2008, right at the end of Bush. Obama had the exact same policy right at the beginning of his term, his first term. So both parties in our country agreed we need to do you remember the stimulus checks of yeah. 2008, 2009? Yeah. We're going to inject money. That's a bipartisan effort. Keynesian Total agreement. economics. And then- Expansionary fiscal policy. Trump and Biden just followed the same pattern. Republicans and Democrats, both printing a bunch of money, pandemic money, stimulus checks. Look, let's just say we give everybody the benefit of the doubt. The Bush administration, the Obama administration, even I know it's hard for a lot of people to conceive of, but let's just for the sake of argument, give the benefit of the doubt to the Trump administration and Biden administration and say they wanted to help people because they're Americans and they care about their citizens. So the government at that time is like, look, people, I, we can't sort out all of the arguments throughout history about economics. People need money. Let's make it and let's give it to people. So it's a short term, it's a short term, uh, I don't know. It, it's like pacifying people. Oh, well, I can't go to work. Look, let's be real. That was a crazy time. People were actually not going to work. Yes, and they were going to starve. Yeah, it's a big freaking deal. I, I get it. I get I get where that, the heart yes, was. Yes, that's where I'm at. I get where the heart was, but it ends up, it's a short-term gain. Yes. But it ends up being a long-term tax on the people that are making the, the least amount. Yes, because now if you go to... Smash burger and get a burger, fries, and soda as I did yesterday. Like the one I went to yesterday it was twenty bucks. Yeah, it was twenty bucks. It used to be five dollars. That was that was your lunch. I would I would eat out at lunch once a week. If I was smart, I I could get out for five bucks. Three dollars and six cents. That's how much money I needed to get a combo at Burger King my senior year of high school. Yeah, that would get it done. Dude, I remember when triple cheeseburgers were twenty nine cents on Wednesdays. Dang, I don't remember that. Triple cheeseburgers, McDonald's, 29 cents on Wednesdays. Dude. So who does that affect? Because yeah. right now, I am not a rich man. There's a basic felt, very real, very authentic need there. And you got to be empathetic to it. But at the same time, there's also a tomorrow. And the game plan right now for currencies looks like, well, there isn't a game plan for tomorrow. And inflation gradually it just boxes more and more people out of the game. And so when the, the money's doing pretty well, maybe you got three or 4% of people, the poor will always be with us. 
and they're not in the game. And that's not good, but we can pick up the slack. A little bit of taxes, a little bit of welfare, a little bit of generosity and charity. But when it gets to be 20% of the people feel they'll never own a home or can't afford to eat out once a week or 30 or 40% of the people, you get tent cities in L.A., And people have to poop on the sidewalk because nobody will let them in to use a bathroom inside. And I don't blame them for not wanting to let people in. And you get a crisis. So ideally, if a currency is working, the monetary value of that currency somehow resembles the actual value of things like food and shelter and clothing and basic necessities. When it gets out of control like this, people start feeling like they're out of the game and they can never get back in the game. And that's when you get, well the crazy stuff, historically. Okay, so I want to read a quote for you. Um, This person I worked with a while back had a very opinionated view of the world. And, you know, you mentioned many Republicans and Democratic leaders, and this person... At, at one moment in time, because of who was in power versus what they felt, okay, they were critical of this person. And what's interesting is it can apply to any to any person in, in the past, right? Sure. So um, there's a quote they had printed on their door of their office, and they hung it up. And I was like, well, that's a little – I mean, I don't know if you should have that here, but whatever. The quote, I just looked it up, was from Alexander Fraser – Titler Lord Woodhousley, no idea who this person is. Uh, Wikipedia says it was a Scottish advocate, judge, writer, and historian who was a professor of universal history and Greek and Roman antiquities at the University University of Edinburgh. Okay. Sounds like a smart guy. Yeah. But I remember the quote because it sh- it shook me when I realized it was true. And I think this little journey you just took me on talks about the quote. And the quote is from Lord Woodhousley, a democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. That's interesting. And voters won't do that? if they're vested and it's working for them. So I have an amendment to this from Lord Will Woodhouseley. If you had the ability through modern technology, and I think this exists, and, and I pray to the Lord Almighty that whoever is drafting up the design for the digital dollar, I pray that they're this smart. We have the ability now to base the value of that currency on math in such a way that its inflation rate could be programmed in. And we couldn't. Much of, mm-hmm. I, I know I'm reading your body language, but hear me out. So like the beauty of the U.S. Constitution is that we baked in our past wisdom yeah, so that we couldn't be idiots and undo what we – figured out was smart back in the day. Yeah, here's your democracy if you can keep it. Yeah, I mean, but we baked in our wisdom. Yeah. If we had the ability in this next pivotal moment in history to bake in some wisdom so that we couldn't debase the currency by using an algorithm. What do you mean couldn't? You mean like it doesn't matter if we're panicked and if everybody's upset. Like if you're going to stay on this currency, sorry. It's not votable. That's just the currency. I don't know. I mean, like in World War II, you got the Deutschmark, you know, you got people with wheelbarrows full of money trying to buy a loaf of bread. <laughs> I'm thinking about Revelation now. A piece of bread will buy a bag Larry of gold. Norman songs. It, yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's making me realize that none of this matters. Eventually, we're going back to gold. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, uh, there you go, though. You're coming full. You're coming full circle with me. You know what my objection is to what you just threw out. It's governed. There's going to be some crisis. Like People are going to protest in a way we don't like. People are going to get upset. There's going to be a riot. There's going to be a famine. There's going to be a natural disaster, a war, or a, a, a personal dispute between a couple. Of, something's going to happen. Something always happens. 
And these are unprecedented times. We have to do something that history tells us destroys our currency and our system of economics and wealth, but we just have to in these moments. Or with no, or I just want a Coliseum. Or I just, if yeah, back then you can get away with that kind of crap, with a 60 <laughs> foot statue of myself naked standing outside of it, which they also did back then. And then everybody's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like it is a very high pressure moment. We better do that. And it's all with the best of intentions. I think nobody's being a jerk, but that isn't a plan for what's next. And so what, I think we can try a jillion things and it's gonna keep coming back to this truth. A thing is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for that thing on a given day. That building block of value is reflected in certain commodities that are basic to life. That value assumption is demonstrated in certain metals that require some work and effort to get out of the ground and that have certain properties and therefore we understand them to have certain value. That value proposition is also reflective of the fact that we have taste. And we like brands and we like stories and this story we might like better than that story. And we're willing to pay a little more for an item attached to this story than this story over here. But economics is psychology. It's, it's us. It's not ones and zeros. It's not chess pieces you can move around. It's humans interacting with each other. That's what the economy is. You and me, separate people who each own ourselves, but see the value in what the other person does and then we negotiate and we try to figure out a way that what you're good at and what I'm good at can make each other better. You're and just describing free market principles. In that, and that is the truth, isn't it? I understand why people think it could be centrally planned. I get it. I'm empathetic to it. But I keep coming back to this. The market's us. Well, I think there's another truth. I think almost every generation is selfish. Uh, I am. I am. And I think we do what makes our life better at the moment. And currencies exist on superhuman timescales. And mm. humans exist on human timescales. Mm -hmm. So the things we do during our lifetime is to benefit us, not the overall value of the currency. And that's why I think it, it would be interesting if we could figure out a way to, to bake in wisdom on the onset of, of an, a new digital currency, if such a thing is to be. What are your thoughts on that? Devil's in the details, or the glory is in the details. Uh, I don't know. Like I'm tempted to just dismiss that on principle, because that, that's not what I already thought before you said it. But yeah, we should talk about anything. Instead of being slaves to our ideology, we, we should be honest thinkers about all the historical data and what we see in front of us. We should be honest about what we know about human nature. But we need solutions. And for a while, we had one that seemed to work. We were able to keep it in balance, maybe with a little bit of bloodshed. I don't find that part very desirable. But now it feels like we're back to one of those cycles we've seen throughout the course of history where economically, the empires that make the world go round fracture and wobble a little bit. And in those moments, everybody starts figuring out, how do I preserve value in this environment? What do I do? Where do we go from here? We don't want things to break. We want people to thrive. How do we do it? So if you're telling me that in your mind that could be a solution and a way to move forward with consideration of future generations, man, I'm not going to dismiss that out of hand because it wasn't my first idea. I'd want to be at the table for that conversation and try to help in goodwill. And if there's some better idea, I'd want to talk about that idea. Or maybe, like so many things in life, it'd be better if we had a competition of ideas and we didn't force everyone to be on one system of value. And maybe the best idea would just emerge and then everybody could jump onto whatever makes the most sense. I don't know. I didn't take you down this road and talk about this because I know what to do. I'm taking you down this road because I find it super fascinating. And I said from the very outset, part of what I like about coins is they all come with a story and it's a point of connection between us and the people who came before us. And so it is here. We have a problem in common with our now long deceased brothers and sisters from the Roman age. And I got a coin right here in this hand, and you got a coin right there in that hand, one from back then, one from right now. And what do you know? For all we've learned and all that we try to get right and all of our sense of superiority, we're just people. And we have flaws and we have nobility to us. And so much of those flaws and that nobility and that potential 
is encapsulated in the story that a simple little coin you keep in your pocket tells. I want to bring up one more point. We've been talking about debasing a currency as if it's always negative. In 2015, I know that because I had to just Google it. In 2015, China devalued their currency on purpose. Okay? I, for the life of me, could not figure out why they would do that. It's my understanding that the reason they did that is because they wanted their citizens to have to work harder to make things in order to sell them to other people. So they created a culture by devaluing their currency that they had to make more things and make more machines to make things, and they had to learn skills, and they played a longer game. In America, our value, I mean, our dollar was strong. So instead of having to go out back and make a thing and get money and sell it, China now, I would argue, and and I think this is indisputable, China can make things better than us. I hate that I have to agree with that. Right. I think part of the reason why they can make better things than us is— Not more ethically than us. Oh, no. No, 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 no. They, they, the, yeah, we won't go there. But I think the reason they can now— is because the dollar was strong, they devalued their currency, and they invested in making people work hard. Which is what real value is. So, if that's true, I don't know that it's true, but if, if, if what I just said is true, then would it be important to bake in things that would allow you to pull the, the levers? Because if you have the ability to maintain a strong currency, I'm arguing against myself now, this future digital dollar. If I did not have the ability to weaken my currency and it stayed strong the whole time, would my economy become so strong that another country could come undermine me and eventually I just buy all the grain and I don't bother to to plant grain in the field? Or is there a natural cycle, a law of undulation that happens no matter what? Yes. Yeah, there should be. So China debased their currency because China cheats economically at every turn. Yes. Everybody else cleans things up regarding climate because we we have data in front of us that suggests that, oh, well, we should change some of our practices. India and China, they're not getting that done. Oh, look how cheap we can make these things. Well, yeah, but we're all playing by these other rules because... We got this data in front of us and we think it's compelling and you guys act like it is, but you're not playing along. Also, you have central planning. You're stripping people of their own motivation to let the motivation of the state be the thing that drives their productivity and their action all in service of the state. Uh, You can maybe do that in some parts of the world, maybe culturally, I don't know, but you can't do it everywhere and it won't work forever. There's a reason that such central planning also always seems to flame out. And I think... uh, the better explanation for debasement and inflation and the relationship between those, that undulation you just referred to, is it really involves resources and innovation. You're going to have surges in innovation and resources, and you're going to have leaner times. You're going to have years when the rain just doesn't fall as well. And as much as we might seem detached from that, you put together three or four bad years in terms of rain and productivity in the fields... It still affects everything. Dude, I remember a drought um, in France that made the river level drop so much that they didn't have water for their nuclear plants. Whoa. And they had to shut down the nuclear plants. In northern Alabama, there's a nuclear plant, and there's a law that says the water upstream from the nuclear plant and the water downstream from the nuclear plant can only vary by just it's some number of degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. And so if the mass of the water goes down, then all of a sudden that nuclear plant's warming up the water a whole lot more. So a drought would affect that as well. Yeah. And that stuff, say whatever you want about phones and tech sector and rare earth and copper and metals and everything. The bottom line is we are organic beings who require a pretty high degree of consumption, a relatively specific temperature control, a decent amount of shelter and clothing to exist and to continue to exist. Those fundamental things to us ebb and flow and have for all of history. We try to technology our way into more stability and we do pretty well. 
We try to government and policy our way into more stability, and we do pretty well. That's good. But still, the reality is, like, somebody's going to go drill a hole in the ground and be like, what? There's a whole bunch of gold in here. We should get all of it out. Like what happened in Leeds, South Dakota. And all of a sudden, a whole mountain's worth of gold. I mean, the dwarven horde just goes into circulation between the 1870s and the end of World War I. That changes an economy. But then they, we don't find another hole for a while. And so it flattens out and it changes a bit. This is happening all the time. And these are forces far more powerful than our paperwork or our votes. Human motivation and the ebb and flow of innovation and discovery and tapping into resources and learning how to use new resources. I think these things are a better explanation for and a better driver of the ebb and flow, uh, the light ebb and flow of an economy versus the drastic boom bust cycle that you get from more centralized planning and artificial forces. And to me, uh, this all comes back to friendship, my dear friend, like the reason that I wanted to put some silver coins in your hand is because it sparks this conversation. It takes you to a new place where you just got to step back from it all and be like, how, how does all of this work? How does exchange work? How does value work? And I carry around coins like this all the time with different things on them just because I think they're neat and because I like thinking about that. And though a lot of people would look at a coin and be like, ah, that's greedy. I look at it and like, this is the product of people. And it reminds me of the value of other people and what they bring to the table and what a privilege it is to be able to engage in relationships and exchanges together and the, the unifying force that this has. So that, that's why that's why I wanted to go to the coin store with you. Thanks for the coins, man. Yeah. And uh, thanks for taking me to the coin store and teaching me about uh, currency debasement. We're not economists, but you've, nope. you've stretched <laughs> me mentally today, both from a historical perspective and just thinking about how money works. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Thanks, man.